There are great movie sequels. You think of the likes of Star Wars and Toy Story. We've got our own part two, and it's going to be just as good. It is with David Hill. You know him, president formerly of Fox Sports, chairman of Fox, was also chairman of Fox Sports Media Group. He has had an indelible impact on the sports media landscape, and he joins me on the On to Something podcast. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio to touch on things we did not get to in the first portion of our chatter and David again appreciate your time here I recently had on one of your closest friends and someone who you have worked with throughout the years in the business and that would be the great Jeff Mason now I asked Jeff about you and here's what he said and here we go he said you are the smartest person he has ever worked with and then to fluff your ego even more he said you have such a great sense of humor. <laughs> what say you about that flattery? Well, let me tell you very quickly that uh, I love Jeff. And uh, he had a pr- profound effect on, uh, on, on my career in, uh, in sports television. And, and let me very briefly encapsulate it. Uh, it was the, early se- the late 70s. Um, I had just started work at the Nine Network in Australia. And we were covering Wimbledon. Um, I had never done live sports um, before. I'd, my career had been as a television journalist. I'd produced uh, news bulletins. I produced studio-based shows. Uh, and I made a lot of documentaries. Um, 16 mil, sitting in an eight-plate steam back, and very few of your listeners will know what one of them is. Anyway, <laughs> and so when, when I suddenly, at, at, at the ripe old age of, I don't know, 30, 31, I got tossed into doing live sports and I found myself at Wimbledon. Now I'm at Wimbledon with two announcers and me and a commentary box and we're feeding and Australia, uh, as you've seen (laughs) pretty recently, Australia is, is devoted to tennis. And so it was a Wimbledon was a huge deal because we had players like uh, then like Yvonne Gong and Johnny Mac, uh, Johnny Newcomb and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there I was like, like totally out of my depth. And I was lucky to have a four wire back to the studio in Australia and, and like scrambling to get a camera to do stand-ups and whatever. And there was Jeff and Jeff was running NBC sports. And Jeff had all this equipment and trucks and people running around. And here am I in this kind of like third world atmosphere and he took me under his wing and um, he explained to me about television production, about live production. He t- told me about the tricks of the trade. Um, I-, I was also very fortunate then to meet a guy called George Wenzel and I met Kenny Agar. And, and then over the years that I would bump into to Jeffrey uh, doing jobs like the US Open or doing jobs like an Olympics, or, or do or one memorable occasion when uh, the, the America Cup was down in Australia, that Jeffrey was heading up the ESPN coverage. And, and so he and I kind of like, we put adjoining studios together and, and it, was, it was just great. And we've had this. And, and then uh, the, the other thing too, is that, that when, when I got suddenly catapulted out of Sky Sports to start up Fox Sports, that I hired two guys as consultants because I knew how little I knew. And in this business, it's very important to know what you don't know. Uh, and I didn't know a lot. And there were two guys that were the unsung heroes, really, of Fox Sports, who were behind the scenes and saying, no, don't do that. That's stupid. Or do that. And that was Jeffrey Mason and Ken Agar. Um, and, and because at that stage, Fox had like a couple of VCR machines playing out two hours product a night. And all of a sudden, in six months, they had to build this incredible operation to take eight NFL games and to switch markets and to have control rooms and whatever. And uh, the, um, the uh, Fox engineering staff led by Andy Cedos was very, very good. And I don't want to cry them, but they didn't have an experience in what, 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 you know, like NFL football was all about. And Kenny Agar worked with Andy and with Tony Sosnowski and, and, put all the engineering structure together. And, and I would not have known Kenny Agar if he stood up in my oatmeal, if it hadn't been for Jeffrey Mason. And 
Jeffrey, like Jeffrey's friendship and guidance and, and, and almost mentoring and the way I saw him run his production. And don't forget, he was drinking then. He was brilliant when he was drinking. And I always wondered what this, I went back to Australia, right? And everyone said, um, uh, what, what, what we was working with the Americans like? I said, well, I met this great guy called Jeff Mason who's really, really cool dude. He does all this stuff and he's done this, that, the next thing. Of course, I was wide-eyed with admiration. And I said, but they drink water all the time. It was like Jeffrey had this polystyrene cup. And, and, and they, I don't know, they don't have, mightn't have faucets or taps over there that, that water, they find out later that it was vodka. <laughs> <laughs> but, and here he was, like, brilliant. Jeffrey was, yeah, I can't, I cannot say too much about Jeffrey Mason. I love the little bastard. <laughs> and he would say the same thing about you. And the other thing he said about you, David, is that you're so loyal to your friends and that you will go above and beyond your responsibilities as a friend to help that person in the business. And I think we saw that in the way he did that for you. And perhaps that was a great point in your life where you realized that even though there are others who might be competing with me at times trying to be the one that gets ahead of this business that there can also be this friendship that can be evolved and that we can work together and one of the things that I wanted to ask you is that as your career was going and we touched upon this a little bit David in our first conversation but I wanted to dive into this a little bit more and I know you get asked this a little bit but as far as some of your most infamous creations with Fox, when it comes to the Fox box and the, the first and 10 virtual yellow line, as far as the first down marker, why do you think when you implemented those things that there was so much vitriol from so many? Well, it, it, the, uh, the, the, the first and 10, uh, like five death threats, but the greatest kerfuffle I have ever created in my life. Uh, and, what I did with cricket, that, that created a bit of a storm, or created a lot of a storm. Um, but it was, was making the hockey puck blow. And, and <laughs> but the reaction from, from Canadians, and for God's sake, I'm a Commonwealth cousin, all right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that that it, was, it, I, it was almost like I was calling for a, 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 like a, a massive kind of like take of, of devil worship or something. Um, and, and I still can't watch hockey now because I can't see the puck. Um, that, that, that the reason is that, that sports fans, and I use the term in its original form, not fans per se, but fanatics, fanatical fans are the most reactionary group of people under the sun. And the reason for this is simple, that they have grown up with their sport. They, they love their sport. Uh, they love the tradition of the sport. And they like things ev ev as they are. And every, any deviation, even in the most narrow form, offends them until they go, oh, this isn't right. This is what I'm used to. This is what I didn't watch with my dad or my mom. Uh, so therefore, this is wrong. And then it takes two or three weeks and they go, oh, it's pretty cool. I like this. So it, it's like that, that there is always this thing. It's, to me, it's, 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 all, it's the same thing with, with um, oh, God, what's that sport in the Canadian sport? We're getting back. Oh, to curling? It. Curling. Now, now, what you will see at the Winter Olympics, and, and this takes place every Winter Olympics, and the, the newspaper journalists say, wow, there's this weird sport called curling. Look at what they're doing. And then the second week, wow, it actually looks pretty interesting. And, and people will form curling clubs and then it stops. And then the next winter Olympic comes along, wow, there's this weird sport called curling. It's like watching a, 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 it's like watching a goldfish go around in a goldfish bowl. They have a, they have a memory of 0.2 seconds, which is why goldfish are quite happy because they'll, they'll go around and they'll go, oh, there's Brian Fenley. Oh, there's Brian Fenley. Oh, there's Brian Fenley. So um, uh, the, the reason is they're traditionalists. They don't like any change until they realize that it's better. And 
any change that I've brought has been because I try and look at things and work out what's not there and create that. Simple as that. Safe to say, as we're joined by David Hill, I'm Brian Fenley. Your memory is better than a goldfish. And if we go back, <laughs> <laughs> yes, if we go back to when you were in your teens and when you were in your early 20s and you dropped out of school to go full into journalism, why is it, David, that so many uber successful people in life dropped out of school? Well, I didn't actually drop out of school. I, I, I finished high school. Okay. Um, but it was because we didn't have any money. Um, I couldn't afford to go to university. Um, my two brothers, who were both brilliant, got common, what's known in Australia as Commonwealth scholarships. 90% in, in my era, 90% of Australians would go to university. And they were either uber bright uh, and the Commonwealth government would pay all their fees. Um, and, but to do that, you had to have this incredible past. Like you had to be like, you know, in the, in the top one or two percent, the government said, well, you're bright, we'll pay you for further education. Adults like me, you're on your own, right? Oh. Um, like my parents couldn't afford to pay. It. So I had to get a job. And my jobs with, with uh, the, the, my, my, what I could do, it was laboring, mining, um, uh, working in a steel mill, whatever. Um, but I really fell in love with words and I wanted to, I wanted to work with words. And the only way I could do that was to become a copy boy. And I became a copy boy, hoping to become a journalist. And I passed an exam for copy boys and I became, Australia has a four year cadetship system for, or had for journalists. You do your first year cadet, second year, third year, fourth year, and then you become a D grade, which is the lowest grade of journalism. And to do that, you had to obviously satisfy your editors with the story of your, of your copywriting, but you also had to do shorthand. So you had to pass an exam at the end of uh, one year for 60 words a minute, second year, 80, 100, and then finally 120 words a minute of Pittman shorthand. Now I can still uh, do Pittman shorthand at about 80 words a minute, but unfortunately it takes me about two years to read a page of notes back. <laughs> <laughs> So it was, it was like, I had no option and, and um, I just fell into it. And so I was a newspaper. I was a, a first year cadet by the time I was uh, 17 and a half. Um, had been working as a copy boy, understanding how a newspaper worked, understand the, the pressure of, of deadlines, understand of having to get the job done, having to understand how to write quickly and well. Um, and, and, and how you can put 20 paragraphs together uh, off the top of your head when you're reading to a copy taker. Um, and so, and, and I was very fortunate that I was offered a job in a television channel and a tiny little television channel in a tiny little town in a tiny little city in, in New South Wales, Australia. And so I, what was fortunate for me and looking back on it was because if I had gone to work for a network, I would have worked in the newsroom and I would have been compartmentalized because I was working in this tiny little channel. I understood, I got to learn everything that made a channel work from presentation to commercials, to the engineering side, to directing, to pushing a camera around a studio, to set design, to lighting, the economics of it, the way the boss worked, the way the program manager worked, syndication work, marketing work. And because we, we were all like next to each other. I went back to that, the, the channel, it was Wind 4 in a place called Wollongong. And I went back there with my daughter, Jane, when we were driving down, I was doing Formula One in Australia. And so we decided to, to drop in and take a look. And, I, and to me, when I was 18, 19, it was this big place, this tiny little place and these tiny little offices and this tiny little newsroom. Um, but I understood what made a television channel work. And that, knowledge has stood me in such incredible set like i couldn't have done what i've done at sky uh like creating what what is now uh, british sky broadcasting without understanding all the elements that go into making up so i was i had an unusual like when everyone else went to college i went to college for four years but i was being paid and i was producing news bulletins i was appearing on camera I was reading bulletins. Good evening. Here is a channel for big news. Big news at the Bulleye Colliery, 
three miners were killed in a cave in this morning, blah, blah, blah. And what was good, it was a steel and coal town. So I was familiar because that was what my dad and, and, and what my mum had come from. So I understood the, the ethos and, and the philosophy of that world. So I, it, I was right in it. So by the time I got into a network in Australia, I, I understood everything about what made television tick. So it was, um, I might not have gone to college, but I did a PhD. Yeah, fascinating. And you, you touched on your intrigue with words. And since we last spoke, everybody has been mourning the loss of John Madden, someone who you had known very closely during your time at Fox. We all know some of the words that he was notorious for saying that made him beloved and cherished as far as broadcasts are concerned. But what were the words he uttered to you away from the cameras in close conversations? John, John was a remarkable human being, and, and I doubt there will ever be anyone like him again. And, and what it's done, and in, in a way, and I think anyone connected with television production should mark this down in their diaries. And that is, why was John Madden so loved? Was it Madden the video game? No, I don't think so. Was it his success as a Super Bowl winning coach with the Oakland Raiders? No. John was a commentator. Uh, and, and, and John had, was a teacher. And John had passion. And John loved the athletes. He loved the coaches. Loved. And, and I mean it. Like, Matt Millen and I had a little, you know, little teary moment at John's funeral on Tuesday up at the Oakland Cathedral. Beautiful building, by the way. Matt delivered the most heartfelt, magnificent eulogy I think I've ever heard. Um, but, but John was a teacher and John would sugarcoat the education pill. So John, and, and, and to me, the massive outpouring of grief about John Madden's death simply points out the importance of an announcer. To me, the role of the announcer in a sporting broadcast is paramount. And that what the announcer does is the most important aspect of the broadcast. And we can have drones and we can have graphics and we can have audio effects and we can do this and we can have replays. They all become secondary to how good your announcer is. And John Madden was the best. Interestingly enough, I have worked with, with, I've worked with many, many good announcers. I've worked with two great announcers. One was John Madden. And the other was a guy called Richie Benno in cricket. Now, interestingly enough, both of these guys were remarkably good and had insights, that, uh, insights into their sport that very, very few other people had. But Richie was a journalist. Richie started off doing police rounds. And Richie was always telling a story. John was always teaching. Now, um, it, 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 these two guys, and both were passionate about their sport. Both were passionate about the athletes. Uh, and, and, and both had incredibly, and I, I hate to use the word old-fashioned, terms of morality about the way the game should be played and sportsmanship and, and all those things that, that we learn as kids growing up and playing sports, whether it's Little League or Pop Warner or in my case, junior cricket and, 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 and what have you. And, and, and they were the embodiments to me of, of all that's good about sports. But let's go back to production and John and um, John, we would talk a lot about the philosophy. John always wanted to learn. So he was picking my brain all the time about, about other sports and other countries. And because he didn't have a passport, we had to go up to Canada to do a game. <laughs> and he freaked me. I don't have a passport. I said, well, get one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and we talked about the way commentary should be done and handled and how that falls in with production. And he said, and I won't try and do it, John Madden, every, accent, everyone does it. He, he said, 
you know what I do? I tell them what they're seeing, but not seeing. And I'll just repeat that because it's worth writing down. I tell them, the viewers, what they're seeing, what they're seeing on the screen, but not seeing. So John understood that the role of the announcer was to interpret what the viewer was seeing on the screen in words that they could understand so the play made sense. Um, he had a remarkable gift, gift for that, um, that, that there has been a few others who, who have that magical gift, but John was, was unique. And, the, and again, I go back to the nation's outpouring of grief at his passing. Um, and I just think that, like, I went up with Eric Shanks and, and what Eric did in having that documentary made uh, and the fact that, and what was just wonderful about how it was meant to be was that John sat up there in his home in Pleasanton, California, and saw it with his family on Christmas Day, along with the rest of us. And then he passed away in his sleep three days later. And, 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 and that documentary that was so well made was just, it was, it was just this pain of praise to a man who was unique. The speech, as we look back at, at you being at his funeral by Matt Millen, what was most touching in the words that Matt uttered? Matt, oh, I, I can't sum it up. It was too good. Matt, Matt was, it was, what was so beautiful was from the heart. And, and he talked about the elements of, of John's, what made John such, such a great person. Um, and it was, it was in, intensely personal uh, and it was highly emotional. And I'm sitting there thinking, dear God, Matt, this is just so good. How are you keeping your emotions in check? And just towards the end, and he broke. And it was just this wonderful, poignant, emotional moment in a wonderful point. It was, it was, uh, it was um, high requiem mass and it was just beautiful. And it was, uh, uh, it, it was like, I'm, I'm sure for, for the few of us that, 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 that were lucky enough to be there, uh, it, it, it's something we'll never forget. What do you think it was like for him to watch that? on Christmas day. I think it was absolutely spectacular for him. And I think that knowing John, there'll be this big shit eating grin <laughs> and sit back there. And, and, and because when you looked at the people, the, 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 the Mannings and, and, and the Aikmans, uh, and, and like these, these footballing immortals who were just pouring out and LT, it was just, just one after the other. And, and, and what he'd meant to them, um, even, to, to, even to the Madden game. And like, like John's going to be long gone. I said to him, I said to him on, on a number of occasions, oh, I got to tell you, the highest praise I have ever received, ever, was uh, John gave a quote about me to a writer in Sports Illustrated years ago. And apparently they, they, they would have said to him, you know, ah, what do you think about David Hill, Australian, blah, 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 blah. And he said, he's the only television executive I have ever met who doesn't look constipated. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. Yeah, now I've, I've now I've totally lost my train of thought. Um, so what made him think that? Because um, I wasn't constipated, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> David Hill is with me. I I'm Brian Fedley. Let me leave you with this. And that is, you've gotten a lot of adulation over your career. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with so many people singing your praises oh jesus um well there's an awful lot of people that think i'm a prick so so it, it's like 
<laughs> I, 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 listen, I've been a boss for a long time. I suddenly got thrown in to become a, becoming a boss. As I told you, I, my, my life from 20 to 30 was sitting in front of a camera, uh, doing political interviews, doing economic interviews. Uh, good evening, here is the seven big news tonight and in tonight's news, blah, blah, blah. Um, or doing kind of stand-ups in, in the news tonight, you're going to see so-and-so and so-and-so. And so I was, I was, I was talent. I was like, there's photos of me up around the city and tra-la, tra -la, and I won awards as best television reporter in the country. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, because of, 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 of a long thing that went through my head and I shifted deliberately from being in front of camera to being behind the camera. One of the things was that I, I couldn't handle people coming up to me and being public property. It, it just, it drove me batty. Um, and, um, and so I suddenly became a boss and you don't have any training for being a boss. You just suddenly become a boss. Suddenly you have people working for you and you're responsible for them and you're responsible for budget. And then as things got gone on, the number of people working for me got bigger and bigger and bigger and the responsibilities got more and that means the stress gets more and whatever. Um, and you have to fire people and, and it's, it, it doesn't work out and it's a terrible thing to do. And I would always agonize over it and agonize over it. Once or twice I didn't, I was just in a white heat, you're fired, boom. Um, uh, but, but in the main, I would agonize it because I realized that, that the call I had to make as a bus to fire someone was going to imp uh, impact their lives. And, and I knew them and I knew their wives or I knew their husband and I knew their kids and whatever. And I knew that me saying, I'm sorry, this is not working out. You're going to have to go. It's going to have a profound impact, not only the person, but their entire family. And I had to weigh up what would happen to the group. and inevitably. I think, I, I hope, I always made the right call when I, I fired someone because people would come to me and say, it's now much more comfortable or whatever. And, and they were appreciative that me as a boss had made the call to fire someone. So then, uh, then in England and then in the States. So it, it was, so there's a lot of people I've fired and there's a lot of families I've disrupted. And I hope, that I did it in the reason to make the environment better or to make the economic environment better or whatever. But all those people are going to say I'm a prick. And, and that's just comes with the, the territory of being a boss. And uh, did I enjoy it? Not at all. But, uh, but I, I got to tell you that the, the number of people that said to me, well, you, you're not looking too bad. And I said, well, I don't have, um, I don't have 5,000 employees. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, stress is real i i always thought stress was bullshit and uh but it's real and 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 i like i uh, the fact that i'm coming to terms with it so late in life uh make me think jesus i'm not that bright after all no you are bright because you've got some really neat golf stuff that you're working on but as you pointed out not everything about being a boss has has the glory there are parts of the industry and parts of the job that include tough decisions as well, let me tell you most of the time being a boss it's 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 tough you, you wake up in the morning and you're just waiting to be hit in the side of a head with a bucket of shit and you know <laughs> it's going to come at some stage but you don't know when and and i can remember like uh, i'm sitting in my house now that uh, all these years, I get in the car out here and I call Lou D'Amelio, uh, the, the head of head of comms um, in New York, and we would talk through the day and we'd talk through what happened, whatever. And by by the time by the time I got to the ten, I'd probably need a bucket of Pepto Bismo. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You were never constipated. Nah, that yeah, we, yeah that's right. Thank that, God. Thank yes. God for that. Thank as John Madden said. You were never constipated, and that isn't among that, all the awards. Isn't that cool? It's like I've like when I think about about that I've been lucky enough to like the induction of the NFL Hall of Fame to be the second producer inducted after the great Runalage meant more to me. I've had two things happen in my life that 
that I was was so humbled by. One was receiving the Order of Australia, um, which which is well, it, which which means a lot to some Australians. And the, and and I won awards and all that stuff, and that's all real nice. But the two most meaningful things was winning the Order of Australia, being awarded the Order of Australia. You don't win it; you, you get given to you for, for services to television, and then being inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame, and knowing that that the the the, the first producer to go in was Rune Arledge, who I who is the the founder of Real Sports Television of all our businesses. Every one of us who've come after Rune Arledge are merely footnotes. And then I went in second. So Rune Arledge and then me, that, uh, my heart did a flip. And uh, I, I was, I had, I had three of my four kids there. Um, and, and it was an incredibly, incredibly proud moment. So they're, they're the two big things that mean a lot. And just realize people might say nice things. There's a lot of people you talk to say, oh no, he's a prick. Well, no matter how good you are, what you do, no matter how nice you are, there's always going to be, like you said, those who don't like you. And it's hard because some of us are people pleasers. And no matter how hard we do that and we try to act in that way, we're still going to have those who just don't like us. But there's so much to like about David Hill. Oh. You mentioned some of the most proud moments so many others that are part of your resume and how proud I am to have you on for part two of this conversation as it is a sequel that, as I said in the beginning, we've got great sequels, Toy Story, Star Wars, The oh, Godfather. Sing 2. Sing 2. Sing, like, uh, now, any animated movie that has a koala voiced by Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> you've got to love, right? I, I, it, it's made by Chris Melandandry. Sing to it is sensational. Sensational. Two thumbs up. Sometimes there can be a bad rap for a sequel, not in this case in part two with David Hill, and not when it comes to Toy Story and, and what they did creating other ones after the first. David Hill, I'm Brian Fenley. Really appreciate you taking the time and just filling us with brilliant storytelling and priceless knowledge. Thank you, Brian.